talk about gastrulation and organogenesis, two great words. Okay, so last time we talked about cleavage. And the point of cleavage phase of embryogenesis was to generate lots of cells. So now you have a bunch of cells that you can pattern. And during gastrulation, which in humans happens about two weeks after fertilization, you're going to start uh, massive changes in shape. You're going to start patterning and uh, determining different cells. So gastrulation is the subject for today. During gastrulation, you're going to create a three-layered embryo. So we're going to talk on this slide about the three germ layers that develop during this process. The first one is the ectoderm. Ecto means outside or something like that. So these are the cells on the outside of the embryo are the ectoderm. And these cells will eventually become a variety of structures, including the epidermis of your skin and other things in the epidermis, nervous tissue and sensory tissue, jaws and teeth, and germ cells. Remember, germ cells are the cells that are going to make the game. So I'm highlighting a few of these things. I want you guys to remember which structures come from which germ layer. This is something I don't like to tell you to memorize stuff, but this is something that you will need to know later on in your career. It has importance for cell biology. So as you take more classes, you'll use this information. So it's worth remembering the classes of organs and tissues that come from each of these germ layers. Meso means something like in the middle. So these are the cells in the middle of this three-layer embryo. They become the skeletal, most of the skeletal system, except for the jaws and teeth. They make your muscles, the circulatory system, the dermis of the skin, that's the under part, underneath your epidermis is the dermis. And then there's the endoderm. This is on the inside of the embryo. This will make the epithelial linings of your digestive tract as well as your respiratory system. So those are the three germ layers that develop during gastrulation. Yes? What are the germ cells again? Germ cells are the cells that will make gametes. So they're the cells that are going to undergo meiosis to make sperm and eggs. We're going to step through gastrulation in the sea urchin, because this is the simplest place to watch gastrulation. So this is a good place to start. Now here is the blastula, the hollow ball of cells. At the start of gastrulation, that's what we have. And down here, these cells in red are going to become mesoderm. Some of these guys, called the primary mesenchyme cells that are destined to be mesoderm, begin to crawl into the blastocele. And that happens because they lose their contact with the extracellular matrix that's around this flashula that was secreted by the cell. So here it's called the hilum layer. They detach from the extracellular matrix, they detach from their neighboring cells, and they begin to crawl up into the blastocele. This is a scanning EM of one of those primary mesenchyme cells crawling out into the blastocele. This is called the ingression of the mesenchyme. So that's a developmental biology term, ingression. It's where these future mesoderm cells crawl into the blastocele. And the next part that's happening here is where these mesoderm, future mesoderm cells vacate, the yellow endoderm cells down here fill that gap so they change in shape and they begin to create an invagination here. That becomes the arc enteron, which is a primitive gut structure. Up at the top, you can see of the arc enteron, there's some mesoderm cells. Those are the secondary mesenchyme cells. And they make these long filopodia. I think I have a picture of it somewhere, but not here. So these guys make the long filopodia that reach out towards the wall of the blastocele. These are really important for guiding the arc enteron as it extends up to the other side of the blastocele. You take a laser and ablate or eliminate these cells, then the arc enteron doesn't make it all the way to the other side of the blastocele cavity. They seem to somehow pull the arc enteron up to the other side. This process is called invagination. It's sort of like if you had a water balloon and you stuck your finger in it, that's what is happening here. 
It looks kind of like an upside down raspberry. This is a scanning EM of uh, a sea urchin embryo at this stage. This opening here is called the blastopore, and that's going to become the anus of the sea urchin. Now here you can see that the arc enteron is extending, and here those philopodia are contacting the blastocele wall and pulling it up. This is where the picture is. So maybe you can see these philopodia from the secondary mesenchyme that are reaching out towards the wall of the blastocele. Now here we have the other mesenchyme cells that migrated out first, that went through ingression. Now this extension of the arc enteron happens through a process called convergent extension. The cytoskeleton of these cells changes its arrangement and causes the cells to interdigitate. And this is sort of like if a lot of students are outside waiting to come into PSLH, there's a big mob of students around the door. But if you force them all into a single file line, it would make it much longer, right? So a mob of 100 students versus a single file line of 100 students. And that's what these cells are doing. They're moving into a single file line, and that makes the arc enteron longer. So here these cells were labeled before convergent extension, and then as they interdigitated and moved into a single file line, they can extend up to the other side of the blastocele. So they don't have to proliferate, they don't have to stretch, they just have to rearrange and become single file to get to the other side. Okay, so once these uh, arc, the arc enteron reaches the other side, the secondary mesoderm goes back into the middle here, where it's going to become organs like the circulatory system. And the arc enteron fuses with the wall of the blastocele and the mouth forms here. So at the end of all this, you've gone from a ball that was the blastula, a hollow ball of cells, to a tube with ectoderm on the outside, endoderm on the inside, and mesoderm in the middle. And that's really what we all are, right? It's a big walking tube. And that, that begins in gastrulation. We can watch that process in sea urchin. I'm going to move this to where we actually get to gastrulation. So here's the blastula. That's where we left off last time. And you can see down here at the bottom the primary mesenchyme cells that will become mesoderm undergoing ingression. They're crawling out into the blastocele. And then you can start to see invagination. So the arc enteron is forming. Up here at the top, we have the secondary mesenchyme that are extending their philopodia out to the other side. And here you can see convergent extension, a rearrangement of these future endoderm cells to help them get across the other side of the blastocele. So that's embedded. You can watch it again later if you'd like. Now I decided that rather than trying to talk about gastrulation in frogs, because it's kind of complex and confusing, I would show you an animation. And then you'll be able to watch it later too. If we look at a cross-section of an embryo of the frog Xenopus, we can see that at this point it is a ball of cells with a fluid-filled cavity. The cavity is the blastocele, and the embryo is currently in the blastula stage of development. A blastula contains large yolk-filled cells at the vegetal pole and smaller cells at the animal pole. The three colors represent the three tissue layers that become defined early in embryogenesis. Yellow indicates endoderm. Red indicates mesoderm, and blue indicates endoderm. At the beginning of gastrulation, a few surface cells, called bottle cells, constrict at their apical ends and expand at their basal ends. These cells move into the interior of the embryo, followed by other surface cells. We can track the movement of cells into the embryo if we add dye to a few surface cells. The movement of cells into the embryo creates a lip, called the dorsal lip, over which sheets of cells continue to move inside. At the same time, the ectoderm extends around the embryo surface in a process called epimoly. As gastrulation proceeds, a cavity, called the arc enteron, forms while the blastocele progressively shrinks. The arc enteron is the primitive gut and is completely surrounded by endodermal tissue. The endoderm at the roof of the cavity originated from the outside of the embryo. The cavity is continuous with the outside via the blastopore, which eventually becomes the anus of the animal.
As the endoderm extends around the embryo, another set of bottle cells forms. These cells migrate into the embryo, and other surface cells follow them, creating the ventral lip of the blastopore. By the end of gas relation, the endoderm has surrounded the embryo. Endoderm lies the inside, and mesoderm lies between the two. Additionally, the fates of specific regions have become determined. The endoderm gives rise to the digestive and respiratory tracts and associated structures. The mesoderm gives rise to the skeleton, circulatory system, muscles, excretory system, and most of the reproductive system. The endoderm gives rise to the skin, sense organs, and nervous system. Okay, so at the end of all this, even though it looks a little bit more complicated than the sea urchin, we end up with a three-layered embryo with the ectoderm on the outside, the endoderm on the inside, and the mesoderm in red in the middle. And you can watch the videos about Drosophila gastrulation on your own if you like. Eric Weichhaus is one of the people who got the Nobel Prize for the work on bifoid, and he walks you through Drosophila gastrulation looking at videos of real Drosophila. It's kind of neat. One of the things that was mentioned in that animation was how you can follow cells in an embryo over time. This is called fate mapping. How you know the cell is here in the blastula is going to be here in the gastrula. And the way you figure it out after gastrulation is by injecting cytosolic dyes into the cells and then following the cells over time. Each of the cells that's a daughter cell of this cell will get some of that green stuff in its cytosol. So every cell that descended from this one is going to fluoresce green. All the cells descended from this one fluoresce red. All the ones descended from this one are blue. And using that technique, you can follow where the cells go in the embryo over time. It's called fate mapping. Now we're going to talk about neurulation as an example of organogenesis. The first thing that happens in this process is the notochord forms from mesoderm. And this diagram from your text doesn't actually have the notochord in it, so I drew it in for you. The notochord is down here, and it's red because it came from mesoderm. The notochord is going to make soluble signals that go up to this ectoderm that's overlying it and change it into the neural plate. So it changes the shape of those ectoderm cells, makes them thicker and more columnar. It also causes them to become wedge-like. Instead of just columns, they pinch at the top. And that allows this tube to form. Eventually, all those wedges together come around and meet, forming the neural tube. And there's some cells up here at the top where the neural tube closes. And those become the neural crest cells right here. So those become the jaw and the teeth and also pigmented cells in your body. They migrate off to other places. This is what it looks like in real life. These are scanning EMs, electron micrographs. So here's the thickening neural plate, and they become, the cells become wedge-shaped, causing this fold to form. Eventually, it comes up and seals at the top here, and you get a completed neural tube. You can see the notochord down here at the bottom. Now, when I was taking developmental biology, I had a hard time remembering that the notochord was mesoderm, because cord sounds like spinal cord, but it's actually the neural tube, the ectoderm, that becomes your spinal cord. The notochord is mesoderm that provides inductive signals to the ectoderm that causes it to become the spinal cord eventually. So the notochord is mesoderm. Now, how do these Cells during neurulation change their shape. Well, they rely on the cytoskeleton. So once they receive the signals from the notochord, they begin to become more columnar. And they do that by arranging their microtubules in a dorsal ventral orientation. So your dorsum is your back. So the cells elongate and become columnar by changing the shape of their cytoskeleton, particularly the microtubules. Once their columns, then actin filaments form at the top, they contract and make them wedge-shaped. And you know it's like a pie. If you put a bunch of wedges together, you could make a tube. 
So by orienting the actin filaments crosswise at the top, it can cause an apical constriction that makes this neural tube, which eventually pinches off, and then these cells up here at the top are going to be the neural crest cells. Now, I don't think that this is in your class notes because it's actually a question from the end of the chapter in your book, so you can go back and look at it later. So the cells, this is an experiment that is outlined in your book where some researchers took cells from the dorsal lip of the blastopore. So the dorsal lip of the blastopore contains cells that go on to form notochord. And when they moved this dorsal lip from one embryo, to the opposite side of another one, they were able to cause nervous tissue to develop on the opposite side of the embryo. So you have the normal dorsal lip of the blastopore causing notochord and nervous tissue to develop. But then you've got a transplanted one on the opposite side of the embryo that's also causing nervous tissue and notochord to develop. So the question is, those cells that you transplanted, put on the opposite side of where they belong, were they totipotent, determined, differentiated, mesenchymal, or apatotic? Which I should have deleted because we haven't talked about it. So nobody answered apatotic. Did I start it? Oh, I didn't even have my floating toolbar. That's a bad sign. There we go. I'm just going to stop it and start over again because I don't know what happened. Wrong question? Oh, thanks. Are we here? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think I must have done a better job explaining this to you guys because you've answered this much better than section A. Okay, so let's see what you think. Oh, okay, so the favorite answer was B, and B is in fact correct, although I could make an argument for some of the other answers, but B is the one that your textbook lists as correct. So determined. They already knew what they were going to be. Even though you put them in a new place, an ectopic location, they were still able to do what they would have done if you left them alone. So this is sort of like that clicker question I asked you where we took back cells and put them in the belly cell location, and they became belly cells. They were not determined. If we'd moved the back cells to the belly location and they stayed back, they would have been determined. So these cells are clearly determined. They are not totipotent. Totipotent cells can become any cell in the, in the body. So the only cells that are really totipotent are very early <coughs> embryonic stem cells. So in that inner cell mass, those cells are true embryonic stem cells and they are totipotent. Differentiated. You might be able to make an argument that they've begun to differentiate, but that's probably not the best answer. I kind of like D as in chymal, because what happened was that those transplanted cells from the dorsal lip form notochord and form neural tissue. So some of the cells they transferred, if they formed notochord, must have been mesoderm, which means they could have been mesenchymal cells. So I think D is reasonable as well. But D is the answer your textbook gives. Okay, another example of patterning. This is the formation of the limb. What we have here is a developing chicken limb bud. And what you see is the apical ectodermal ridge. So of course this is ectoderm over the top of a limb bud that's emerging from the embryo. This apical epidermal ridge produces signals, soluble signals, that cause the cells underneath to proliferate. You're going to need lots of proliferation if you want that limb bud to extend out to be a whole chicken wing. There is mesoderm underneath the AER, and that mesoderm is essential to maintain the AER. If you kill these mesoderm cells, the AER will go away. It won't make the proliferative signals anymore. So these two things signal back and forth. The AER and the mesoderm exchange signals to help maintain each other as the limb bud grows and the cells proliferate. Now the second part of the limb bud here that's going to act as an inducer that will help pattern the limb bud is this zone of polarizing activity. It's polarizing because it's telling 
Malin, which side is which? Which side is anterior and which side is posterior? The ZPA is over here on the posterior side. And it's going to create a morphogen gradient. It's going to secrete a soluble molecule that will diffuse away from the ZPA. And where there's lots of that morphogen, cells become posteriorized. They act like the back part of the wing. And where they're far away, they become anterior structures. If you're not really sure what anterior and posterior mean in a wing, it's, it's hard to tell what the back and the front is. If you imagine a chicken laying on its stomach on the ground with its wings up like this, your thumb is sticking up in the air. That's digit number one. Digit number two is your pointer finger. So this would be the anterior part of the wing. And then it's pinky is down here. So the posterior part is the, the back part of your hand towards the pinky. And as you read through some of the examples and experiments in your book, it's important to understand that the anterior posterior axis is an abstraction. It's kind of hard to tell from this diagram. OK, and I put this note in here to remind me. I showed you those flies that had the antennapedia mutation where they need a leg on their head in the position of their antenna because you move the Hox gene around, the homeobox, homeotic gene. Well, of course, you might imagine that vertebrates also use Hox genes for limb development. So there's conservation of that developmental program between the flaws and the vertebrates. Now we've been talking a lot, a major theme here in gastrulation is the cells are doing a lot of moving and in organogenesis, they're moving and changing shape, lots of things are going on. But it's not all about the cells. We get very focused on cells and kind of forget about the extracellular matrix. And hopefully you haven't forgotten this picture from the first half of the class from earlier in the quarter. Dr. O'Dowd showed you the plasma membrane and the extracellular matrix, these proteins and glycoproteins that cells secrete that form kind of a scaffold that cells hold on to to things like integrins. So the extracellular matrix is really important if you're going to do migration and shape change. If that cell needs to crawl from here out into the blastocele, it needs to have something to hold on to. In my mind, I think of the roadrunner, how his legs are spinning when he's up off the ground, when he sits down, boom, he goes, as soon as he has something to push off of. I was thinking about how when I was a kid and I was on a swim team and we were tired and the coach wasn't watching, we would grab the lane line every time we took a stroke because you can go a lot farther if you have an anchor to hold on to and you can push yourself forward. So for the cell, it needs to hold on to that extracellular matrix to push itself forward and crawl. The ECM is also an important scaffold to give the organs, the gastrula, the blastula, shape. It's not just a sort of ball of cells. It develops shape and structure, and the ECM helps support this. It's also important for developing vasculature. So once a ball of cells gets bigger than about a millimeter in diameter, it needs a blood supply. Nutrients and oxygen can't diffuse into the cells in the middle unless there's vessels that go into that structure. And the ECM, as you'll see in a minute, plays a key role in developing that vasculature. The ECM also has what might be kind of an unexpected role. It provides signals for growth, and it also helps establish morphogen gradients. It binds lots of growth factors. It can change the function of these growth factors. It can bind morphogens and change the shape and depth of morphogen gradients. So the ECM plays an absolutely critical role in many different, maybe every stage of development. It's extremely important. So when you start thinking about medical implications of development, one of the things that we would like to be able to do is build new organs. Right, if you have kidney failure, liver failure, a problem with your lungs or heart, you need a transplant. There aren't very many organs, transplants are difficult, and then there's issues with rejection. So if we could build organs in vitro, that would be a great thing. And if you're thinking about development, you might think, well, maybe we could just recapitulate development in a dish. And I think that you've got the impression that that would be very difficult, that the temporal and spatial patterns of gene expression are so complex it would be really hard to do this in vitro, but maybe someday it will be possible. And in addition to just making a ball of cells that does the right thing, they need to have the right structure. They need to be able to hook up to normal blood vessels. 
And so a group of people has come up with a really interesting strategy to build an organ, and I think it's really relevant to our discussions of development. So I am going to show you the sig nova. Go back to the beginning. This time. Okay, let me get stop. I should have gone here. Let's try it again. I hope we don't have to watch an ad. If it doesn't work, there's a backup plan. <laughs> All right, let's try one more time. There we go. If something in your car breaks or stops working, like your radiator, you can always just take it out and replace it. But what about us? If my body parts break down, like my heart, I might be able to get a transplant. But right now, even if I could find a replacement part, one, it's going to be used. And two, my body might just reject it. The dream would be to replace my heart or whatever's broken with a brand new version in perfect working condition, but exactly like my original. People have been talking about this for years, but now, thanks to some brand new discoveries, the dream of custom-made, personalized body parts may soon become a reality. They grow clones and harvest their organs. But real science may be on the verge of a less diabolical solution. This, for example, is no special effect. It's a lab-grown lung, no clone attached. I absolutely see a day where you'll walk into a manufacturing facility somewhere and there will be jars of kidneys, and jars of livers, and jars of lungs, whatever it is you need. Just as in the island, your body would accept the new organ because it would be yours, grown from your cells. And there would be no more waiting lists for organs. There would be no more rejection. We would enter a new era where we could build you an identical, ideal replacement. Make an organ without a body to build it in. We've been growing cells in the lab for decades, but they just sit around in flat layers or clumps. So how would you coax them to form a three-dimensional organ like a heart with chambers, valves, and blood vessels? Maybe it's the same way you go from this to this. See, an organ is not unlike a building. It's a collection of parts that has to come together and work together. Think of a cinder block as a cell. The problem is, a block or a cell alone is not enough. To construct a building, you need to begin with an internal framework or scaffold to define the parts and hold them together. Thirty years ago, transplant surgeon Jay Vacanti and chemical engineer Robert Langer realized that to build an organ, cells also need a framework, a scaffold to guide their growth. The challenge was to engineer scaffold materials living tissue could grow on. So this is a material that we call bio-rubber. Bio-rubber, and you, you use the prefix bio because whatever is the material it will take to flesh or living cells. That's right. So why does the cell even care? Because, this, because a lot of things could be toxic to a cell, uh, or, or the cell wouldn't like their surface and wouldn't be able to grow on. Picky cells. Sounds are picky, but some are more picky than others. <laughs> but sculpting a scaffold out of the right material was only a start. To turn one into a living body part, an ear, for example, it must then be seeded with cells. A few weeks in an incubator allows those cells to multiply, covering the scaffold. Then comes a rather strange test. This is really creepy. I mean, mice are creepy enough, and this one has no hair, and a human ear growing on its back. Yes. 
He doesn't seem to mind that him and you're growing on his back. No, he knows he's here for a bigger purpose. But this is a very, very important step in the science because on the back of this animal, we're actually incubating and growing perfect cartilage in the shape of a human ear. And it's completely connected to the blood vessels so that it's just like a native ear in a normal circumstance. In the head of a person. That's correct. So when this finally gets implanted in a human, you don't expect rejection, as is so common with new body parts. Exactly, because we're going to start with the patient's own cells. It'll make his own tissue, and therefore the body will accept it. Within a year, Vacanti and Langer expect to be implanting their ears directly on the heads of soldiers wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. But these will not be the first recipients of lab-grown body parts. Already, patients of other doctors have received blood vessels, skin, muscles, even bladders built the same way. I think with enough research, most parts of the body will be replaceable. And I haven't come across very many body parts where somebody somewhere isn't working on trying to replace them. Which is certainly encouraging news for people who need more complex body parts, like 20-year-old Stacy. I was in the hospital and that's when they came in and told me that I may need a new liver. But will she get one? Every day, nearly 20 Americans die waiting for donor organs. So this problem is an extraordinary problem. There are too few organs for the well over 100,000 Americans waiting. But if we were ever to make the complex organs most needed to save lives, like livers and hearts, the scaffold builders would have to overcome an obstacle, namely plumbing. In a building, it's pretty straightforward. Pipes carry fluid where it's needed, just like blood vessels in the body. Except that in a major organ, like the heart, you need a blood vessel per cell because the heart works all day, every day. And I don't know if you've ever seen blood vessels, really, but they look like a tree. And the challenge is not to build that big limb, but to build those little tiny branches that come off. But building these intricate branches might be unnecessary if we take advantage of a remarkable fact. Organs are not just native cells. So if you wash the cells away, what's left? Well, what's left are these proteins on which the cells sit and they form the framework of the organ, the scaffold. These natural scaffolds hold an organ shape down to the smallest detail, including every blood vessel. So could they be used to build a complex organ like a heart? Six years ago, no one could say, because no one had ever stripped a heart of its cells, leaving the scaffold intact. But Taylor's colleague, Harold Ott, thought he could find a way. He would use the blood vessels in a rat's heart to deliver a chemical that would dissolve its cells and nothing else. But which chemical? So the process of finding the right chemical was literally a try and error process, starting from A to Z on the chemical shelf. First, Ott tried enzymes, but they dissolved both the cells and the scaffold. Other chemicals caused the hearts to swallow. Finally, he tried a soap commonly found in shampoos. We saw the heart become translucent. And it was obvious to us all that something had happened that hadn't happened months before. What we had is this thing that looked like a heart. But it looked like a ghost heart, if you will. Injections of dye showed the scaffold to be undamaged down to the smallest blood vessels. And we now know that this technique works with many organs, including human-sized ones. This is essentially the scaffold of a heart. Who knew a heart had a full skeleton? But it essentially has no cells, dead or alive. It's beautiful. You can see the blood vessels here, the chambers of the heart. You can see the valves. But could a bare scaffold once again become the framework of a living heart? 
Taylor soon discovered it was more than a matter of injecting cells. Just putting cells on a scaffold isn't enough. It's putting cells on a scaffold and giving them an electrical signal and giving them a mechanical blood pressure and then giving them oxygen. It's not just a heart in a jar, it's a heart in an artificial body. So it's simple in many ways and it's unbelievably complicated. After eight days, the first lab-grown heart beat on its own. It really makes you go, what is life? The first time you see something beat that was dead, it's one of those yes moments in life. Since then, Ah has joined Massachusetts General Hospital and used the same method to build a pair of lungs. After coming back to life, one lung was successfully implanted in Iraq. So if you can make a working, living lung, then it seems to me you can build literally any organ. Any, any organ. This novel approach has already made a difference in the real world. In Barcelona, Spain, this woman, Claudia Castillo, might be dead without it. Two years ago, tuberculosis devastated her windpipe, <coughs> making it difficult for her to breathe. But surgeon Paolo Macchiarini saw a solution. Give Claudia a new windpipe, which her body would never reject, because it would be made of her own cells, grown on a natural scaffold. And so, in June of 2008, Macchiarini and an international team of specialists removed the windpipe from a human cadaver, washed it clean, and reseeded it with living cells from Claudia's body. Four days later, the new windpipe was transplanted into Claudia. If you transplant an organ without tissue engineering, you need immunosuppression, you need close watching, and this was absolutely not the case for Claudia. She never had any sign of rejection. Indeed, four days after surgery, she was hoping. More than a year later, Claudia is living a normal life, free of the fear that she will reject her new body part. I feel like the transplant is not from the body of another person. It's mine. That sense of ownership might soon be crucial to organ recipients, because their scaffolds might not come from a person at all. This is a pig kidney sliced in half, and it's the same size, same complexity as a human kidney. We could cover this with human cells, and in theory, build your kidney. Human organs built on natural or artificial scaffolds, made from a patient's own cells to avoid rejection, available in unlimited supply. Most researchers believe it will be a reality within decades. And Taylor is even more optimistic. Kidney, liver, lung. We're not decades away from building something complicated. We're more like years away. matrix 
There's no cells here, but the liver cells would live in these little molds. Okay, I am going to finish up by talking a little bit about programmed cell death, which is actually one of the things that I see in my own lab. It turns out that from very early in development, all of the cells in your body are poised to die. If they don't receive the appropriate survival signals, they will kill themselves through a process called programmed cell death. And certain kinds of programmed cell death get the label of apoptosis which actually means leaves falling off of trees in Greek. So apoptosis is one kind of programmed cell death. Programmed cell death is prevented when cells receive permission slips, signals from other cells that it's okay to grow and survive. And this interdependence of the cells in your body is really critical to maintain all the different cell types in homeostasis, in equilibrium. So if a liver cell is dependent on a signal from another cell in order to survive, then it can't grow out of control. It can't grow beyond the limits set by that other cell. And that means that we have tissues and organs that are balanced, that are in homeostasis. When this process breaks down, problems with apoptosis lead to the development of cancer because cells grow out of control when they can't die when they should. Now, how is apoptosis important during development? Well, one key way it's important is sculpting structures. So you can imagine if you want to go from a solid ball of tissue to a hollow ball or to a tube, you might kill the cells in the middle in order to film, form your hollow ball. Or in your hands, if you think about your hand and compare it to a duck's foot, ducks have webbing between their toes. We don't. That's because the cells that were forming these interdigital webs die during development. They undergo programmed cell death. Another way that apoptosis and cell death is important is deleting unneeded structures. So over evolution, some structures have become not necessary in us, and they apoptose during development. If you're a male, the female reproductive organs undergo apoptosis and disappear. If you're male, then the female, I'm not sure which I said first now, but whichever, the opposite sex ones disappear. Controlling cell numbers. A great example of this is in your brain. You have way more neurons when you're an embryo than you will have, than you will have when you're born. The ones that fail to establish connections will die through a process called pruning. They disappear. And eliminating non-functional or abnormal cells. So if a cell doesn't do the right thing, and it's in the wrong place, you want to get rid of it, so they undergo programmed cell death. If you make an autoreactive B cell that makes an antibody to your own tissue, that's going to cause problems, and normally they undergo cell death. Now what does this look like in animals? These are mouse, this is an embryo, this is a newborn mouse pup, and these, this is a wild type normal animal. These three have deletions in genes that are required for programmed cell death. And so the neurons in their brain persist. They don't die. They're not pruned. And as a result, they end up with exencephaly. Their brain spills out of their skull because there's not enough room for all those neurons. This is a mouse that was developed in a lab I used to work in. It's lacking two proteins that are needed for apoptosis. You can see the normal mouse clears its interdigital webs, but this one doesn't. So that's it for lecture. Remember the mid, your uh, final exam is a week from Wednesday. If you want to ask any questions, come down and see me. Have a great weekend.